So it's 12 noon. I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, just a, a quick reminder to please uh, enter your questions at the end of the presentation. Please enter them in the chat and please answer a brief survey that will be sent to you uh, right after the presentation. And we're very fortunate today. We have uh, Dr. David Blank from the Division of Medical Biochemistry has invited two speakers uh, for presentation today. And I would like uh, Dr. David Blank to introduce our speakers. Welcome, Dr. Singh and Dr. He. Dr. Blank, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, first speaker is going to be Dr. Kavi Singh. He has 25 years of clinical experience, including work in rural and remote Indigenous communities of Northern Canada, as well as urban centres. Uh, managing septic shock and preterm delivery in the remote dispensaries while organizing snowmobile medevacs opened his eyes to the reality of the austere medicine uh, in, our, in our country. So after 15 years of practice, he returned um, back to school and uh, got his residency in uh, emergency medicine um, as this was as a, a part of an effort to bridge the divide between the urban medical uh, education and remote health cares, including First, First Nations. He's got a particular interest in optimizing medical capacity and human factors in resource scarce environments. Um, the second speaker is going to be Dr. Gang He, a medical biochemist who works here at the MUHC. He oversees our immunology section. He obtained his MD at Shanghai Second Medical University and then did an internal medicine residency in China before coming to Canada, where he went on to get a master's degree in molecular biology at U of M and then an MBA degree from uh, John Molson Business School. And finally, he did a medical biochemistry residency here at McGill um, and joined us on staff about three years ago. In addition to his responsibilities at the MUHC, he also oversees the laboratory services for the Cree region in Northern Quebec. Uh, Dr. Singh, as our first speaker, is now going to tell us about snowstorms to COVID storm, First Nation pandemic realities with the Cree of EIU Ishi. Dr. Singh, it's Thanks yours. Very Thanks very much, Dr. Blank. Thanks for the great introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> some of you may know me, some of you uh, may not. Uh, over the last couple of years, I was on the phone with a lot of uh, my internal medicine colleagues, particularly infectious disease. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome, everyone. Today's uh, Medical Grand Rounds, uh, snowstorm to COVID storm, First Nation pandemic realities with the Cree Nation of Iwisji. Um, Dr. Hay will be uh, doing the latter part of the talk. And so let's get started. Um, I have no disclosures, and we'll do a quick territory acknowledgement. Uh, Montreal is situated on the traditional land of the Mohawk. Um, also known as the Kanyan Kehaka. Uh, we recognize that they are the traditional custodians of the land. I'm uh, currently in EUSG, which is home to the 18,000 people uh, of the James Bay uh, Creek Quebec community with a vast territory uh, covering, including the eastern shores of the James Bay. And we uh, acknowledge the rights afforded by the JBNQA Treaty. <clears throat> so let's get started. Today we have uh, five learning objectives. Number one, for the EUSG James Bay Cree region of Northern Quebec, first define the territory's geography and describe its effect on health care. Secondly, outline the major social determinants of health. Number three, describe the major chronic disease entities. Number four, describe the op operational challenges and strategies used for, outlaw for creating a COVID uh, response and COVID, COVID preparation. And lastly, to describe the challenges uh, in providing laboratory services in such a vast, uh, vast area. Now, when Dr. Uh, he approached me for Hi. this talk, he um, mentioned that he'd like to have some emphasis uh, on a bit of the background of the region, uh, since uh, uh, many of the members of the audience will never have traveled up here or know very, know very little about it. So, so let's get started. Uh, objective one is defining the actual Cree territory. Um, and its geography and the effect on healthcare. So the map on the left is a map of Quebec with the 11 uh, First Nations uh, that uh, make up Quebec. The area up here is the James Bay, uh, sorry, the Hudson's Bay, and down below here would be the James Bay. The, the yellow squares represent the James Bay Cree of Quebec. And you'll notice that very approximately, you'll have some yellow squares on the coast. We, we call these the coastal villages, obviously. And inland here, we have several villages or communities, which we call the inland communities of the James Bay. 
Um, you will note that as of approximately uh, this line here, it just has to be the road ends in Quebec. There is no road access north of the, of the La Grande River. The image on the right is a close-up of the James Bay Cree villages and communities. We have Montreal on the bottom right, and then Val d'Or, Midway, the inland communities. I'm currently in Mysticini. Shibugamu is a non-Cree community with a hospital about an hour away. And then we have the other Cree communities, Ujibugamu, Waswanipi, and Nemska. On the coast, uh, as we go up, Wiskaganish, East Main, Waminji, and Chisasabi. Uh, and lastly, Wapmex 2, which has no road. Uh, Chisasabi has a, a small to medium-sized regional hospital. Um, and the other big uh, centers will be Valdor, Amos. Of note, what's interesting is that the region is vast. Uh, there's actually four different administrative regions, which makes uh, delivering medical care complex. We have uh, Montreal Region 6, uh, Abitibi Region 8, we are Region eight, uh, 18, Shibugamu an hour away is Region 10, and uh, they have a different Ruiz than us. And so the actual medical care and geography don't always align. Uh, Shibugamu is a different Ruiz. So if you're Cree and you have a heart attack, you end up at the MUHC. But if you're not Cree, you end up in Shikudmi, which creates uh, certain challenges uh, in terms of uh, continuity of care. Another way to look at it is if you're going to drive from Montreal to Chisasabi, it's about a 16-hour drive if the road conditions are good. And if the road conditions are not good, then it will take you considerably longer, uh, 24 to 36 hours. Uh, it is not uh, without danger. A nurse who was hired by the Cree Health Board several years ago, unfortunately, uh, using GPS, uh, followed uh, an un, uh, an un, um, uh, plowed road and ended up getting stuck in the snow and unfortunately perished in the cold. Um, so the, the distances are real, the remoteness is real, and the isolation is real. The main access is, again, by plane and also by road. Um, but winter does play a very real effect in terms of uh, the logistics. Um, geography, isolation, they're real. As I just mentioned, uh, weather uh, is a big deal. It's a winter, 8 out of 12 months. We're covered currently under a couple of feet of snow already. Um, this affects vastly medevac capacity, road access. The area is huge. We're about 400,000 square kilometers. Everything uh, costs more, takes more time, and is more difficult to access, whether it's food or whether it's healthcare. Service accessibility is also more difficult. I've only written a few here, mental health, cardiology, lab medicine, obstetrics, but the list is very, very long, as you can imagine. And as a general trend, as you get further uh, up north, workforce shortages become more acute. Health literacy tends to decrease the further you go north. And food costs and material costs tend to go up drastically. So the end result is that problems that we typically would solve very quickly with the corridor chat at the MUHC uh, are essentially impossible in the north because there is no common corridor. We have nine communities spread out over 400,000 square kilometers. Um, and things that we take for granted take uh, much longer to do. Now, this is a, a video. We'll try playing it. Uh, the broadband sometimes um, uh, affects the quality. It's something I made for the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians. I was invited to do a, a, a talk on rural trauma and resuscitation. That's not today's topic, but I think some of the images will be entertaining and interesting for our viewers to see. So it's about uh, two minutes long. Here we go. Anybody know what happened to him? One, two, three. Here we go. Fred come and call the doctor as soon as possible. Let's have that guy came with his friend banging on the door. Donald no trauma. Abdo really agitated. Okay, Nelsie, I need an IV, O2, monitor, cardiac um, monitor. Call the RT, do the vitals, do everything, okay? We cannot even get his clothes off. Okay. 
Okay, let's recap. His fast is positive. There's no lump sliding uh, on the right. Okay, let's go through the ABCs. Um, his airway's intact. His GCS is decreased. So... Do you want to switch? No, I don't think we have time. Let's just get an oral airway and LMA and take him with us. Okay. Perfect. His breathing is poor. Um, his respirate is 22. His sat is 92%. Uh, so let's get a needle. Do you want a chest tube? No, I don't think we have time. Let's okay. just let's just do a bigger thoracotomy after the decompression. Okay. okay. And C, blood pressure. Do you have the IV? Uh, no, I can't. I've been trying. I okay. can't have one. Have you guys done an IO? Only on mannequin. Okay. Have the IO. Eduardo, you'll do the ultrasound. Sam, you'll do the monitor. Um, Antoine, you're the RT. You'll take the head with Lori. You'll do the intubation, Lori, if it's necessary. Sarah, can you put in a right chest tube for me, please? Yes, plug it on. Okay. Nancy, can you call for the massive transfusion protocol, please? Yes. Um, let's notify the surgical team and um, prepare the OR. Now that's just a quick um, a quick look at some of the uh, differences that you might expect to see uh, just in terms of resource scarcity and resource availability. And uh, we'll talk a bit about those. Um, that was meant to be sort of a typical community that doesn't have lab or radiology access. And everything takes longer. As you can see, uh, the doctor is asking for things to be done, but it literally does take 10 minutes to cut off a skidoo suit. Um, and ideally, normally in a normal resuscitation within 10 minutes, everything is, is ready to go. So let's move on to our, our, our second objective, learning objective, uh, outlining the major social determinants of health. And uh, yes, that's a picture of me with my, my little one there. Um, so let's talk a bit about history. Um, <clears throat> Sir John A. Macdonald, father of Confederation, uh, stated, let's take the Indian out of the child and solve the Indian problem. And that's kind of been uh, the status uh, since. Uh, recently, a couple of days ago, there was an article about uh, potentially more deaths at the Quebec Residential School in Fort George, which is Chassassabee, which is the James Bay Cree territory. And even in 1907, Dr. Bryce, who uh, worked for the Department of Indian Affairs, uh, whistle blew on the practices in residential schools uh, and the chronic underfunding, leading to death rates of approximately 50%, primarily from tuberculosis. His report was ignored. And subsequently, he was advised to stop making reports um, because they were costing too much and primarily because there was no plan to take any action on them. It was convenient uh, to actually be losing uh, these dispossessed children. Uh, if you've been reading the news in the last year, you're aware of the uh, discovery of unmarked graves in Kamloops on the Shuswap uh, Reserve. And then subsequently in other uh, reserves, uh, including uh, Chisassabee, Fort George. Now, if we move to today, um, things aren't all that different. Uh, I'm sure most of you had heard about Joyce Echequan, who uh, uh, passed away in Joliet Hospital. Joyce was actually a patient at the MUHC. She delivered with several of her children there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> she uh, ended up recording what was happening and, um, and posted the video, which went viral. Uh, the coroner uh, in her report concluded that if she had not been uh, First Nations and that she'd been white, she likely would be alive today. Um, and Dr. Samir uh, Shaheen Hussain, who's an emergentologist at the Montreal Children's Hospital, has written an interesting book uh, discussing the issue about uh, colonialism in medicine and how uh, traditionally when we've medevaced sick children, primarily from Nunavik, but also the James Bay, uh, the parents and caregivers were not able to accompany them. Um, and some of my colleagues wanted me to point out that this isn't a one-off. Joyce is still happening today. It's happening every day. I routinely have conversations with healthcare workers um, uh, that are discriminatory and I have to do my best to advocate for the patient. Um, and it kind of gets us to ask ourselves the question, what, what's our exposure? And we all have inherent biases. And the example I'll give is uh, there is no alcohol sold on the reserve here. Uh, there is alcohol sold in Shibugamu an hour away. So if people want to consume, then typically on a Friday night, um, they'll head to Shibugamu. Now, what this ends up doing is the people who are busy working, taking care of their families are not in Shibugamu on a Friday night. The people who are, are the ones who want to consume, and they may represent half to 1% or much less than the population that's, that, that actually lives here. 
Um, but the exposure that the people of Shibugamu get is going to be to the people who are actually consuming. And that becomes their sort of um, recognition of what a normal uh, First Nations person is. Um, and it becomes a skewed representation, but that's the representation they have. And I think we need to understand that in our exposures um, in the hospitals as well. Um, the clients we're typically seeing from First Nations communities are the ones who are most socially disadvantaged. That doesn't mean that they represent all clients. And it's normal to, to have these biases, but it's also important for us to examine them uh, so that we can provide uh, the most optimal care uh, to, our, to our patients. Uh, Chief Justice Beverly uh, McLaughlin back in 2015 referred to Canada's treatment of its First Nations as a cultural genocide. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about social determinants of health. Um, so at the in the middle, you'll see uh, individual factors, age, sex, constitution, individual lifestyle factors, social and community. And then the green area is big uh, housing. Do you have safe housing? Is your housing uh, moldy? Uh, what's your access to health care? Water and sanitation. We'll talk about that in a bit. Things we take for granted. Um, unemployment, financial status. Your living and working conditions, are they safe or unsafe? Your level of education, your level of health literacy, your access to health information, uh, food security, or rather insecurity. So all these things play a role. And they're not things we necessarily typically think about uh, in, in a usual patient encounter. And I certainly didn't uh, when I started medicine. And so if we translate that into real life, uh, we have a 42-year-old uh, female diabetic who's hypertensive comes in with a hemoglobin A1C of 12%, which is very common up here. And she's not been taking her medication regularly. And she tells you she has trouble remembering. So as dutiful doctors, we reinforce the importance of avoiding uh, complications such as nephropathy and retinopathy and the need to take the medication. If we're a little bit more advanced, we'll do some motivational interviewing to try and uh, assess out where she is in terms of her stages of change and trying to um, um, uh, get on board with, mo with the, uh, giving her tools. We'll encourage her to walk 150 minutes uh, a week and do a follow-up in two or three months uh, and repeat her labs. Now, when she leaves your office, and this is the difference between uh, treating someone who's been traumatized where I'm providing essentially 100% of the care. In chronic disease, uh, the patient is providing 98% of the care. Um, and so what ends up happening is when she goes home, she has four grandkids at home she has two teenagers at home because her son is off working on a mine and can't be there to take care of them. Her partner uh, consumes alcohol and is regularly violent towards her. Her son committed suicide uh, three months ago, and there is food insecurity and financial insecurity at home. And her daughter was just brought in for self-harm. And this is an actual case we had about uh, eight days ago. This is an elbow joint, two inches distal to the elbow. Um, and that uh, is a real laceration. And you can just about uh, barely see the bone poking through the bottom of the wound. And so if we step back and think about our patient encounter, uh, it sheds it in, in a different light. Um, and in emergency medicine, uh, we talk about dealing with a crocodile that's closest to the boat first, because that's the one that's going to capsize the boat first. And for this lady, uh, diabetes is most definitely not the crocodile closest to the boat. And so when you were speaking about metformin or insulin or Genuvia, or exercising, those things are, are not at all on the menu at the moment. She's dealing with uh, bigger things. If we took a look at the Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs here, we can see that the first two levels are physiologic and, and safety. And without the first two levels, you don't advance to the next levels. And it's not a surprise. It seems obvious, but it's something that we don't necessarily think about. If the first two levels aren't met, don't be surprised that your patients are either not showing up to appointments not taking their prescriptions as required, not following treatment plan, or not even providing honest feedback because they, they want to try and please you. Um, and this is something that uh, we really need to be aware of um, um, in, when, when we're dealing with our First Nations clients or socially disadvantaged clients. This is a slide I pulled out from a trauma talk I did, and it's a study done by the McGill trauma team, Dr. Razek and his team, uh, which uh, even though I work in the North, uh, I found uh, disturbing. And the rate, uh, the relative rate of trauma mortality uh, in remote versus urban for the rest of Canada is about double. If you live in a rural area, your chance of dying is twice. They went and looked at Nunavik, which 
is problematic in the sense that like the James Bay, we don't actually end up on the provincial trauma registry. And they found an unintentional mortality rate from trauma versus the rest of Quebec to be 24 times. And that number makes no sense. I was in fact convinced that they'd made a mistake in the paper. And I went back and reviewed the data and crunched the numbers and, and there was no mistake. And the most telling is when you include intentional trauma, which is self-harm, such as we witnessed in the previous photo, and uh, unintentional trauma, the rate jumps up to 50 times um, that of the rest of Quebec. So this is the background of what people are dealing with when they go back home and are dealing with their diabetes, hypertension, obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, or whatever it is. And if we try to do a bit of root cause analysis, our classic approach of looking at age, family history, obesity, diet, exercise, in terms of being risk factors um, in isolation, there's a role for that. But if we also consider them in the past context of uh, past and current colonization effects, we have here in the diagram, the bottom, the loss of traditional land and food. Normally, there's no need to exercise. Uh, if you're out fishing and hunting or gathering all day, you burn four to 5,000 calories just doing your day-to-day -day activities. Uh, your food is primarily uh, uh, wild game and berries. It's a very low carbohydrate load, and that's changed or non-existent. Non -existent. Now we have grocery stores uh, where you can get uh, pop that is cheaper than water. And so you have the loss of one, introduction of another. You have all the other social uh, issues that are arisen, stress, racism, massive cultural changes and spiritual spiritual changes. Um, and this has all happened within the space of a, a couple of generations um, uh, in, uh, in Africa, Asia, and, and, and Europe. We have generations of history of farming. Uh, and up here, uh, the Cree, they have none. Uh, grocery stores were not something that uh, food was not plentiful two generations ago. People did starve. Uh, and if you speak with uh, older people here, they will tell you stories of starvation happening. So there's been massive, massive changes within the space of, of 100 years. Uh, intergenerational trauma gets passed on to the next generation and then the next generation. And this gives us kind of a deeper, more realistic look of what's going on when our patient's not compliant. And, and an example I can give is, is parenting and teaching kids things that I take for granted that I learned from my parents. I routinely see in clients here who went to residential school. Um, they're missing some of what I would consider basic skills and how to parent. And the reason is it's because they weren't at home and they didn't have a parent. And it, it sounds very simple, but but a lot of the root cause is there. Basic discipline, basic, basic uh food consumption, some of those things just don't happen. And uh, and we end up with um with the complications we see today. One last quick final note, just to, for everyone's literacy. Uh, the James Bay on the Quebec side is very different than the James Bay on the Ontario side. And the reason is in 1971, uh, Premier Robert Barassa, as Quebec was coming out of the Quiet Revolution, wanted to make Quebec more self-sufficient. And he realized that there was a lot of untapped hydro potential in Northern Quebec and decided that it was going to be exploited. So they decided to build some uh, big dams. The Cree and the Inuit uh, realized that they were about to be dispossessed of a lot of their land and said, hey, no one actually came and talked to us. This is not okay. Uh, and he said, sorry, but too bad. So they took him to court. And in 1974, uh, to a lot of people's surprise, the court sided with the Cree and the Inuit and all work stopped. And the result was the JBNQA treaty, uh, the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. And it uh, gave uh, a say and a share in economic financial development, developing health and school boards, government resources, airlines. Uh, when you fly up here, you take Air Cree back. And this is a very different reality than the shore of Ontario, James Bay. You will routinely hear about Arawapiskat and Kasechuan because they uh, almost most of the year have boil water advisories and have unpure uh, drinking water even after 30 years and routinely have infectious disease outbreaks. So very different reality, uh, even though they're both essentially uh, James Bay Cree. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the wealth has solved certain issues. Uh, we don't have an issue with drinking clean water up here, but it has brought other issues such as um, increased rates of diabetes, and then also the uh, availability of, uh, of money uh, brings with it uh, more availability of illicit substances. And you'll see a different pattern of use here than you will, for example, in the more remote Inuit communities where there's less money and uh, more difficult access.
So let's quickly describe the chronic disease entities that are the main issues up here. And uh, in one word, diabetes. Uh, on the right top uh, image, you'll see uh, Quebec's uh, prevalence of diabetes around 6% or so. First Nations communities uh, here at James Bay, 17%. This data is from 2010 to 2015, I believe. So it's already out of date. Yeah, 2015. Um, and so a rate of approximately uh, approaching three times. And all the attendant complications, uh, gestational diabetes, cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, an astounding rate of nephropathy, uh, chronic renal failure. We actually had one of our workers uh, fall down and syncopize uh, three days ago and uh, found him in a pool of blood and wasn't sure what was going on, whether it was massive hematemesis. And he ended up having a, a massive right-sided MI with bradycardia. We thrombolized him and he's currently at the MUHC as we speak. Um, so we're starting to see uh, more and more of the effects. The graph on the left shows the uh, prevalence of diabetes over time. Uh, now, I suspect back in the early 80s, there was a bit of a selection bias. I don't think lab access was quite as readily available as it is today. And I don't think screening was done as uh, as much as, it, as it's done today. However, a 20-fold increase uh, also doesn't account, um, uh, is not accounted for by a selection bias. So you see a staggering, astounding rise in the prevalence of diabetes and all the complications that come with it. Um, as mentioned before, the rate of diabetes um, amongst the James Bay Creek compared to the rest of Quebec is about 3.6. Um, it's hot, actually higher in women, uh, we suspect because of the rate of gestational diabetes, which subsequently can lead to diabetes. Um, and uh, from 2002, the percentage of Cree people with kidney disease and diabetes was 58%. Uh, Mysticine and Shibugamu dialysis units are full. And we have patients waitlisted getting dialyzed in Montreal. And uh, a study from the University of Manitoba projected that from 96 to 2016, the increased incidence of stroke would go up by five. And for cardiovascular disease, dialysis, amputation and blindness would increase by tenfold. And I can corroborate that that's essentially what we're seeing on the in the field here um, day to day. Now, if we take a quick glimpse at the past, these are pictures taken from our local, uh, one of our local stores, and these are actually people from Mysticine. These pictures range from the mid 40s, early 20s, and uh, this one here um, from the 70s. If you're interested, the National Film Board has a film called The Cree Hunters of Mysticine. You can take a look and, and, and see Sam Samuel here, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, you don't see much obesity uh, when you look at these old pictures and the old videos. Uh, and for a myriad of reasons, lifestyle, exercise, pre-contact food is very different from post-contact food. But uh, these pictures just go back and uh, reinforce what we saw uh, in, the, uh, in the previous graph here uh, with the astounding increase in the rate of diabetes. Uh, what's coming up, pediatric type two diabetes, we are now diagnosing four-year-olds with type two diabetes, which is unheard of. Um, it's the canary in the coal mine. Uh, if you can imagine a four-year-old uh, with a high A1C, by the time they're 15 or 20, uh, we're looking at end-stage renal failure and, and retinopathy and everything else. And uh, it's the canary in the coal mine. And at that point, uh, or at this point, uh, prescribing insulin, exercise, metformin, genuvia, ozempic, whatever you want, uh, I think is um, is not going to do the job. Uh, there's much bigger societal issues, societal pressures, agricultural subsidies. Um, uh, you know, it, it's not normal that we can go buy a two liter bottle of pop for less than, than, than a bottle of carbonated water. So these are societal issues. They're affecting us everywhere, uh, not just in Canada, not just in the North, but certainly they're more pronounced and progressing more rapidly up here. Uh, let's move on to the second last learning objective. So operational challenges and strategies for rural and remote COVID preparation. So um, back in January of the year um, when COVID was first starting out in 2020, I started to see reports in the news about uh, some new virus in China. And thought, oh, well, this will this will never happen here, but let me just send an email off to some admin and say, hey, I'm just reading the news. Do we have some kind of contingency plan? And I was reassured, don't worry, we have a little plan started, it's in progress. 
Um, later on in February, uh, as we all know very well now, things didn't settle down and die down. And I sent off a second email saying, hey, just out of curiosity, how is that plan going? Because uh, as much as I don't think it's going to come here, it's probably prudent to make some, some more concrete plans. And I was reassured that uh, things were progressing well. At that point in February and March, we started to see the number of cases in Italy rising drastically. And very shortly afterwards, we started to see um, uh, fairly impressive death rates amongst physicians um, and, and nursing staff in Italy. Um, and when looking at the numbers, if you look at the middle column here, uh, this is the R number of each illness. Uh, flu after 10 iterations will give you 14 cases and COVID it wasn't even comprehensible to me at the time that after 10 iterations, you could have 60,000 cases. Um, by early March, I was actually in touch with colleagues working in Manhattan and they were starting to get hammered. The number of deaths in New York was increasing exponentially daily and the morgues were starting to fill up. And, um, and then uh, a plan finally came out in early March and it uh, was not an operational plan, it was more a conceptual plan. And uh, at that point, I started to feel like we might die uh, because uh, we had members of our community attend an international mining conference in Sudbury uh, where COVID was present and those members came back to our community. And the reason I thought a lot of people are going to die is because you've seen in previous slides the uh, number of people who have diabetes here, chronic renal failure, and all the attendant complications um, and I haven't even mentioned the other illnesses that we tend to have up here, like rheumatoid arthritis, pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other big issue up here is massive housing uh, overcrowdedness. And so if you, you think COVID is spreading quickly in a city, imagine a place where the majority of houses are overcrowded and have uh, five to 10 people living in them. So uh, some numbers started to come out. These are data points from the U.S., and some of them are very disturbing. The Pueblo population in Mexico represents 9% of the total population in New Mexico, but at that point early on, it was representing 60% uh, of cases. Uh, in Arizona, uh, we can see a 4% uh, population rate, but an 18% rate of death, um, and similar things in Wyoming. And this... Uh, uh, caused me to have some visions of panic. Uh, I've done some work overseas and was imagining mass casualty situations right here on our doorstep. And at that point, already in New York City, uh, the morgues were full. They were calling in the refrigerated trucks to hold bodies, and they were starting to dig uh, mass graves. Um, so now it's no one's fault uh, in terms of the team that made the plan that it wasn't operational. They don't have the expertise. But what should have been recognized at that point is that they don't have the expertise. Um, and um, one of the reasons is this is not our first rodeo. We've lived through SARS, we've lived through MERS, we've lived through uh, a couple of other H1N1, we've lived through several other pandemics, um, and uh, it appears lessons weren't learned as well as they could have been. So now what? Uh, I have confirmed members from a mining conference with COVID living in the community. I have no engineering department. There's no HVAC personnel here. There's no infection control team, no security. We have no PPE to speak of, and there's no intensive care or ward for that matter. I don't even have paramedics. I don't even have a veterinarian to, to help. Uh, and so you very quickly realize you're on your own. Uh, everyone everywhere else was also fending for themselves and trying to survive. And you end up being MacGyver up here. You are the respiratory therapist. You're the engineer. You're the infectious disease uh, expert. Uh, you're the occupational therapist, you're even the janitor. So uh, in the top left, my anticipation in early March was that within about two weeks, based on what was happening in Italy, that 10 to 15% of the medical staff uh, would potentially be sick and or dead, uh, particularly the older staff, uh, me included, and some of my colleagues who were in their 60s. Uh, we would have crushing patient load and that we would not be able to medevac anyone because uh, medevac capacity would collapse. That led to feelings of desperation, and uh, unfortunately, the fear of death is very motivating, uh, and a realization that we are on our own, and so either you crawl into a corner and cry, or you do something about it, so we decided to do something about it, and so at that point, um, I decided we were going to ignore all other advice from administration and everyone else for that matter, 
and I locked myself in a room, um, got the input of a couple of colleagues I work with here. One is a nurse who's worked with MSF and has experience overseas with the Ebola outbreak. Uh, she was my go-to for infection control, and I was on the phone probably with many of you at the MUHC, the JGH, and in New York City, uh, doing live time updates on what's happening, what's working, and what's not working. And so we created an operational plan within 36 hours. It started off as a Google document. Then we executed it over the next two months. I slept four hours per night for two months, which I didn't think was possible, but it is. And we created a, a second and third emergency department uh, for hot and cold zones, a field hospital set up. We created a ward, an ICU. We set up medical concentrators. And after work, when we got home, um, my wife and I would, because she's good at sewing, she's also a physician up here, we would make PPE. And so she would sew, I would cut HEPA fil filter vacuum bags, and then cut snare wire, which is used to trap rabbits uh, and make nose pieces. And we would make garbage bag uh, PPE jackets. And we drafted family, friends, and anyone who would help to be able to help us. At some point, uh, her dad, my wife's dad, who's uh, in IT, said, why don't you create a website? And I said, why on earth would I do that? I've got enough to do. And he said, because it's going to be faster, more accessible, and easier to modify than your Google Doc. And those are magic words to me because speed is of the essence in pandemic response. And so we made uh, an A to Z guide on how to set up a COVID facility, whether you want to do it in your house at the MUHC or up in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's a free open access medical education resource. Uh, you can check it out. It's the website we created, Emergency Medicine uh, Performance Under Pressure. Uh, and the site's been used uh, worldwide now. Uh, we shared it with Nunavik, uh, and we shared it with colleagues. Uh, a lot of use in Australia and other parts of Canada. Um, so uh, it was the best of times, but it was really also the worst of times, and I'm glad it's over. Um, and I'm going to pass the um, floor on to Dr. Hay now. I will be, in order to save time, advancing his slides. Uh, so, Dr. Hay, so just bear with us. There's a bit of a mix-up at the beginning. So, Dr. Hay, when you're ready, uh, go ahead. Okay, I'm ready. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm going, uh, I, first, I have no conflicts uh, of interest uh, to di disclose on this talk. Um, I'm in charge of the Cree Laboratory Services for the whole region. And uh, today, I'm going to mention some of the challenges we are facing uh, in the Cree region. Uh, first, we have all, only one regional hospital. Um, that hospital is isolated, and this is the central lab to serve all the coastal communities. Uh, that includes uh, five, uh, six, uh, actually uh, six uh, communities. And uh, we don't ship uh, samples by car. We ship samples by airplane. And for specialty tests, we send out to, uh, for example, MUHC. So there's a long delay uh, before we can get a specialty test result for clinical decision making. Then um, in, the, in the big north, really, there's no uh, entertainment. There's a no bar. Alcohol is forbidden in the Cree region. So there's a high turnover and the lack of laboratory workers uh, uh, in the big north. And also, as I mentioned, CHSACB laboratory is isolated. There's a really no backup and we cannot easily send out some tests, uh, you know, in a nearby hospital. And uh, before I uh, started in 2014, um, there really, um, there was a lack of a point of care testing apart from uh, some simple glucometers and some uh, simple uh, dipsticks urine dipsticks. Okay, in the past, really in communities, uh, there was uh, no uh, biochemistry testing. So in the event of an uh, unsure case, for example, uh, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, we didn't have uh, other meanings, but uh, by uh, sending the patient uh, by medevac, by airplane to the south, it will cost uh, roughly $10,000. And nowadays, um, we uh, established the, some point of care testing um, before the COVID uh, using a simple uh, handheld uh, instrument. We can do uh, now blood gas by chemistry, troponin, 
hematocrit and the hemoglobin and the PTINR with some special cartridges uh, in the communities. And um, now we started to treat uh, some keto diabetic, um, you know, acidosis patient in the community. As uh, one doctor mentioned, uh, this uh, hand uh, held, uh, you know, instrument is really a game changer in the healthcare in the uh, uh, communities. And we even developed some uh, working algorithm for point of care troponin uh, to help uh, to uh, some decision making regarding chest pain. And now uh, with the launch of a high, sensi uh, high sensitive uh, uh, point of care uh, troponin test, uh, we are thinking about upgrading uh, of this uh, point of care troponin to high sensitive uh, point of care troponin test. Yeah, next. Yeah, when uh, COVID uh, came to, uh, uh, to uh, the Cree region, uh, we quickly installed a gene expert for nuclear acid detection in laboratories. And uh, we deployed ID now uh, in all the communities and even in uh, Expresso in Montreal, where all uh, patients uh, came to Montreal for a specialty, uh, you know, a specialty uh, appointment or treatment. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Yan Sunyi and uh, also our other healthcare uh, workers. And uh, recently, we established uh, multiplexing on gene expert uh, for detection of uh, uh, SARS CoV 2 uh, influenza and ISV. And uh, we just uh, launched uh, you know, this multiplexing test. And uh, thanks uh, to um, uh, Dr. Kwam. And um, with this, uh, I end uh, my uh, presentation here, and uh, we are ready for questions. So oh, thank you. Uh, really, really impressive, uh, impressive presentation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing this with us and, and the videos and, and the sort of more personal stories. Uh, and, and congratulations, really, you've done tremendous amount of work uh, with obviously very limited resources. And, and congratulations for, uh, for for everything that you've done, um, you know, for 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 the patient population that you are taking care of. Uh, we're going to open it to questions. Uh, you can enter your questions in the chat. Uh, I, this is a question here from Sasha Bernatsky uh, asking about uh, diabetes. On the diabetes slide, you talk about FRN in, in communities, mm -hmm. off communities, uh, and the METI. Uh, can you clarify our issues differ across these groups if possible? Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that, Dr. Singh? Yeah, so what, what you'll it's, it's a complicated question because you will find that um, some First Nations communities are located closer to urban centers uh, where we are, we're quite more isolated from urban centers. Um, so even within the James Bay region, for example, you will notice that the rates of diabetes on the inland communities, which are closer to Montreal and Shibugamu, uh, is considerably higher uh, by about 10% uh, compared to the more Northern communities, which are more isolated. So a lot of it depends. In some jurisdictions, you will find that First Nations uh, communities in urban centers actually have higher rates of diabetes. So it's a complicated mix of geography, uh, uh, finances as well. Uh, in Quebec, amongst the James Bay Cree, we have higher rates of diabetes um, in the north. Uh, primarily, I think one of the reasons is because uh, financially we're a little bit more well off. and We have access uh, to groceries and, and easy access to food. Um, but that will vary in the United States, for example, those numbers can be reversed. Um, so, and I would suspect if you look at Winnipeg or Saskatchewan, those numbers would be potentially different because there you also have urban reservations. So it's really uh, province and place dependent a little bit. Yeah, quite concerning. You're talking about the four-year-olds who are having diabetes. Um, Obviously, there's major changes that need to happen. I guess which are which are you know if you were to rank them in priority, it, it, how would you approach this? The, these young kids who are getting diabetes. I mean, I'll be honest with you. The first time I saw it, I I think I depersonalized and thought I was in a dream. Like it's it's something you can't even imagine diagnosing a four year old with type two diabetes. It's, it doesn't make any sense. And at some point, after working for ten years, you're you're laughingly, but kind of not laughingly saying, hey, we need to put metformin, uh, Lipitor and <laughs> in the water. Um, <clears throat> but you also start to realize um, that there's a bit of medical futility going on 
in the sense that you can be the best diagnostician and the best uh, the best of therapeutics, but the majority of the care being provided isn't done by you. It's really done by by the client and the patient. And uh, you know the example I always give to people: if you took a hundred random people on the street and you asked them who thinks exercise is good for your health, in general, I think eighty to eighty five percent of them would raise their hand. But if you ask that same group who actually exercises regularly, maybe 20% would raise their hand. And it's not from lack of knowledge. It's that when they step out of your office, the rest of life takes over. They have to work. They have bills to pay. Uh, they have a mortgage. Um, and they have issues with substance abuse. And we saw all the historic reasons. Uh, those reasons are amplified up here. So what we're doing is a very small key in a problem that requires many keys to solve. And I think this is where um, physicians have a role uh, in terms of uh, expanding our role in terms of public policy. For me, that's really the only way that I see out of this is um, we need to tackle this on a public health level as well as an individual patient level. And we need to advocate at a governmental level um, because the question is much bigger than just the individual person. If it was just the individual person this problem would have been solved uh, much more readily, and and it's and it's not. And the numbers the, the numbers show that. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Rosenblatt. Did you want to ask your question? We have a little bit of time. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? I guess I can if I could read it <laughs> and remember it. <laughs> uh, it it's just a, a very amazing presentation. One of the things I always wonder about is. Um, when you do you have any data on population sizes and life expectancy over the last 150 years? If we went back to traditional culture and mores, what is the sustainable population of the area? So uh, I don't have actual data. And when you start to go back that long in time, a couple of confounders start to arise. So um, what will happen is 100 years ago, starvation was not uncommon. So you have the other side of the coin. Uh, there probably wasn't a lot of diabetes, but food scarcity was also a thing. Um, and so traditionally, and you'll find this in many cultures, even where I grew up, uh, being uh, bigger and a bit chubby is considered to be healthier because if you get tuberculosis or some other chronic disease, uh, you probably have a better chance of surviving if you've got some extra, extra body weight. And being cachectic is a sign of illness. So traditionally, uh, being larger is favorably looked upon here, uh, as in many cultures, Middle East to Asia. Um, and life expectancy becomes complicated. The only people who would potentially have the statistics would be the Hudson's Bay Company and potentially the church in terms of life expectancy at that point in time. And possibly uh, back in those days, it was the, um, the Indian agent who would keep those figures. So those would have to be historical documents we look at. I suspect that life expectancy uh, was not crazy high at that point because of uh, the impact of uh, infectious disease um, and also starvation. Then you'll have a transition period where modern medicine ends up coming in. You have cleaner water, you have access to antibiotics. Um, and so I suspect, and I don't have numbers to prove this, that there would have been an amelioration. Uh, maternal mortality would have started to decrease as you get modern obstetrical care. And now we're on the other side of the coin where we're starting to see uh, the flip side of, uh, of wealth, essentially, and getting massive rates of diabetes. And I mean, the example I gave, uh, the MI that I thrombolized uh, three days ago, uh, the gentleman is 37 years old. Um, and he's not someone, you know, the classic risk factors for, at that age would typically be uh, cocaine use. He's not a drug user. He has diabetes and hypertension that are poorly controlled, and he admits to it. Uh, and that's that's unheard of. Uh, he's younger than me. And he, but they're probably genetic factors as well, given that some of the things you're talking about are, were actually protected in the, in the original yeah. environment. And there's, and there's, there's talk of what's called the thrifty gene effect. Um, uh, it's quite possibly true that if you took... Uh, a few Cree people and you took me and threw us out in the land uh, that I would probably die before them in terms of my genetic and molecular adaptations to being able to survive uh, food scarcity. Um, and anecdotally, we note this. We note that uh, for the first 20 years I worked up here, uh, for the amount of diabetes we saw, we didn't see the amount of heart disease we would expect to see, but we saw 
insane amounts of, of nephropathy. Uh, and in, a, in an equivalent population in Montreal, you would expect a bit more of a balance of stroke, cardiovascular disease, and nephropathy. We just didn't see it here. Now in the last 10 to 12 years, I would say we're starting to see more stroke, uh, more cardiovascular disease, and the nephropathy has just uh, uh, is, is, has not abated at all. And we have astronomic rates of chronic renal failure and, and dialysis um, on, on the territory and off the territory. Thank well, you. Uh, oh. I probably want to add something uh, because uh, uh, right now there's uh, not so many uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, clinical trials uh, done uh, uh, on the Aboriginal people and uh, on the Cree people, there's only, I think, uh, one uh, genetic study done. And uh, this is uh, the domain that we probably have to explore uh, to see why uh, uh, Cree people, they are prone uh, to uh, diabetes, diabetic uh, complications. There's a huge initiative with the First Nation population going on now with the Hidden Genome Project to try to overcome those gaps in knowledge. Uh, George, uh, George Fantis, you have a question. Would you like to ask your question if you want to unmute? Sure. Yeah, hi. Great talk. Um, it's sort of along the same lines of the diabetes. That's our favorite topic in endocrinology, one of them. Um, I was working in Ontario a few years ago, and they, they did have um, a lot of data on the Sioux Lookout population of Cree. And there uh, they yeah. instituted sort of an exercise program by bringing in playgrounds for the kids and walking paths and so on and discussed uh, changes in what the stores were offering in terms of food. So I was just wondering if anything like that is going on here on the Quebec side and uh, or if we have any plans for that in terms of prevention. Yeah, very good question. So there are initiatives. Um, Quebec en Farm has worked closely with the communities up here. We have uh, we have facilities set up. We have playgrounds. Uh, you know, we have a pool now. There's a gymnasium. The, the problem that ends up happening, in essence, we're talking a little bit about social engineering. You make uh, facilities available, people will use them. Um, you provide people with the opportunity, they'll take it. Uh, what ends up happening is, uh, two issues end up happening here. One I find is, um, well, there's always an issue with recruiting people and getting people to come up here, the expertise you need. The other issue is the longevity of these programs. Often they're funded by a government initiative or a public-private partnership for a period of two to four to five years. And when that funding is done, it kind of evaporates. And so building in long-term solutions is a major issue here. It's also a little bit at the whim of the government that happens to be in power. And so these are sort of structural issues that affect all the interventions that happen up here. And the other point I'll make is that nothing that's happening up here isn't happening in Montreal or Arkansas or, or, or Saudi Arabia. And you're sort of having a fight of social engineering to create more walking paths, more bike lanes against the social engineering of chips and uh, junk food being readily available and being really cheap. And, you know, we've had conversations with restaurants and, and, uh, and grocery stores here. Um, and there's been some movement, but at the end of the day, they're private businesses and they're there to stay in business. And, uh, you know, there's been talk of, we need to ban all pop and chips on the reserve, like they did for alcohol. But the question is not so simple because you have a road here and then what ends up happening, and this is what you see commonly in the Nunavik villages, um, when you ban alcohol, it becomes a black market commodity, and then you start to create a black market. Uh, and then the bottle of pop starts to go for 5, 10, 15 bucks. You get smuggling, um, and it's very hard to control that. Uh, and so you get all these unintended consequences. Um, and the other thing that uh, tends to happen is um, it's very hard uh, to police those things. So it's, it's a complex interplay of things. Um, and the other thing that I think is really lacking, uh, you know, we've had exercise initiatives here. If, if I was in charge, <laughs> uh, what you really need to do is really put your money where your mouth is. And listen, it's a winter eight out of the 12 months up here. I'm quite active. And for me to go outside right now, it's not fun. It's minus 15. It's covered in snow. I can't just throw my running shoes and go. There are actual impediments. There's friction to making these things happen. If you want to make it happen, you need to create, you need to hire 15 kinesiologists, have them up here full time, have them with me 
in consultation with the nutritionist at the same time, and we're all on the same page. I think there are ways to do this, but there's a bit of a lack of political will or maybe even vision. But I think that's where we're going to have to go in the future. As an example, I run a musculoskeletal clinic and uh, I don't inject people. I have expertise in, in musculoskeletal ultrasound, but I will only see you if you see me with the physiotherapist because we're going to make a rehab plan for you. And we've had amazing success because the physiotherapist is there with me. We make a plan together. He knows exactly what I'm doing. If I need to do intervention, he helps me with it. And we get some results. And that's where we need to, I think, kind of move uh, towards the future is it's not enough to counsel people to exercise and then kind of hope that they do it. Uh, we have to realize that there's structural, systemic, and just lifestyle uh, friction points um, that get in the way of achieving these successes and that there are also structural lifestyle um, um, points that are the opposite of friction points that make it easy to sit at home, turn on Netflix, and uh, not get outside. And so, thank you, thank you for that. We we have a couple minutes left. Um, Brian Gilfix has a question. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to ask your question or I can ask it for you. Um, uh, go ahead, Brian. Uh, hi, ev hi everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I, I'm just curious since one of the problems limitations from from laboratory side is having people there. Are there any initiatives to encourage First Nation individuals to become laboratory technicians or other support personnel? Because people who live in the area are more likely to, who are brought up in the area, are more likely to stay in the area and become uh, appropriate professionals in their area. Sure. So that's a good question. And um, there are initiatives. For example, the Cree School Board will offer a pays for all post-secondary education. If you're a member of the Cree communities up here, your schooling is paid for. Um, so I wish I was Cree for that. <laughs> now, what ends up happening is the reality is that if you go and take a look in the primary school and the high school, the graduation rate is approximately 50% at best. Uh, those kids who do graduate from here when they go to school in the South typically need two years of uh, extra time and remediation to be able to get up to the same level. So um, there are some, some real uh, structural issues in terms of educational challenges. And I've talked about the health board side of things, but you could have an equivalent talk by the Cree school board uh, and they would avail you of even more difficulty uh, than I'm experiencing um, because it's very hard. And there's very complex reasons for that. Um, um, some people, one of, one of the, 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 the benefits of residential school was that it educated people enough to be able to sue the Quebec government uh, for the JBNQA agreement. Uh, but not all families up here necessarily valorize or understand the, the value of scholarization or necessarily had the exposure to it for them to understand it. So you get quite a mix. We talked about the region being fairly well off, but there is a great disparity here in, in wealth and poverty as well. You will find um, very poor people and you'll find people who are, who are more well off. That translates to schooling as well. There are some families who, uh, where I work, it's a bit of a unique situation in that we have access to Shibugamu, who will take their kids out of the school here and send them to a school in Shibugamu or even in Montreal. And so what ends up happening is you sort of get a selection bias. The families that tend to valorize or, or understand the importance of education, their kids are no longer here. And the kids who are here are uh, potentially from families where it was never something that they learned about. And so you have a real issue in terms of teaching, behavioral issues, substance use at school. So, so yes, we would love to have more physicians, nurses, and doctors. And it is happening. We're starting to see that. But this is a long-term process and uh, and. We're talking 15, 20, 25 years before we start to get enough people. Uh... Yeah, for Dr. Gilfix, uh, during my eight years of practice there, uh, we had uh, one laboratory technicians uh, uh, in the lab, but then she left for school and uh, left uh, the Cree region. And uh, recently we have a tech B uh, started to work for the Cree uh, laboratory uh, at Chisasi. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, uh, you know, Brian for, for inviting our speakers today. Thank you, Dr. Singh, Dr. He, really fascinating uh, lecture and, and really uh, excellent presentation with uh, really both on a social and healthcare and uh, a really complicated, obviously, uh, issue. 
uh, but really, really well done, very informative for us, uh, really a lot to learn. And I hope you do come back to give us uh, uh, more lectures in the future to see how things evolved. Uh, thank you everyone for participating in the discussion. There's still a lot of qu questions in the chat, so you can answer the questions. Um, and uh, I invite you to stay on to answer the questions. Thanks everyone for being here today. And I wish everyone a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, that was very interesting. I just wanted to uh, signal that we're, we're, we're launching in Quebec and we've gotten some really, really positive feedback on this at Lifespan Research Network. And one of the diseases that we're interested in is diabetes. And uh, the fact that you're finding diabetes in patients, type two diabetes in patients who are younger and younger is, is not only very interesting, it's also not surprising uh, because we really believe that these uh, cardiovascular metabolic diseases are really lifespan conditions. And I was wondering if you would be interested in uh, potentially participating in networked research projects like this, where we could enroll patients like that in our studies. Yeah, it's something we're, we're in a better position now since uh, about two or three years ago, we um, started using an EMR and uh, luckily COVID happened which delayed the implementation of the EMR. But what it allowed us to happen is one, one of my colleagues, Dr. Ajemian, uh, is a Royal College emergency trained physician, but he's also a clinical health informatics uh, specialist. And oh, so it, 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 it gave us a chance to not do what happened in most places in Quebec and have to rush the EMR. And so we were able to develop uh, templates, uh, get a business engine, uh, and actually can access data. So for sure, if you, you you can contact me afterwards and we can sit down and have a chat with Dr. Yeah, Jim. that would that would be very, very interesting because it seems like a little microcosm of a really interesting uh, disease uh, model there. So thank you so much. And thank you for all your entrepreneurship. Wow, that's really impressive. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Arianda, I just want to add... Uh, uh, if you need uh, some laboratory data from uh, for this uh, patient, uh, you can contact me. And uh, okay, last, okay. Last week, uh, we submitted the uh, um, uh, CIHI uh, round proposal on uh, our F FH, but uh, certainly for diabetes. Oh, you need okay, it. okay, and, okay. Uh, I will be interested uh, to collaborate with you. You know, if fantastic, you need data. fantastic. Fantastic. So I will get your contact information from Nadia. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. I also have a question to Dr. He and Dr. Singh. Sure, go Can ahead. Yep. Hi, um, that was an incredible talk. I kind of messaged you on the side, but it's, I'm one of the new uh, faculty members, Ms. Judy. Oh. That was really like, it was like hitting the right heartstrings. I'm a, a woman's heart health cardiologist new to Quebec. And as part of a CIHR uh, in call to action, there is a women's health um, coalition grant. And um, together with a bunch of very strong key players like Louise Pillow, Janelle Diane, Sonia Anand from Hamilton, mm. just to name a few, we're looking to create um, uh, initiative that will tackle the language and cultural sex and gender barriers uh, for women um, at risk for heart disease, uh, and specifically uh, for women of immigrant and racialized uh, Indigenous Black um, right. backgrounds. I'm an immigrant refugee myself. Right. So, you know, after hearing this talk, and I, I saw one of your wife's patients and immediately wanted <laughs> to like meet her because I thought yeah. she was such a good champion um, but having met you and I you guys are my husband and wife that's even more aligned so I'm just curious to know if you would be interested in this yeah, for sure we have interest and we have uh, um, uh, and just a general note to everybody um, traditionally there's been an issue with First Nations research in terms of the data ownership and so uh, for anyone looking to do research um, obviously it goes through ethics board review uh, and then if you Google First Nations OCAP pr principles, O-C-A-P, that's mm -hmm. ownership, control, access, and possession is a whole sort of framework uh, to ensure that the data belongs to the First Nations. But it's definitely something that we're interested in. And as I mentioned uh, uh, previously, we're in a much better position. The, the reality up here is also an incredible dearth of clerical and support staff. 
Um, and so just gathering data, like I've done some summer studies and, you know, it's a slog just to gather basic data. The EMR is a game changer in that sense. It opens up uh, some facility in getting basic information, uh, but it's certainly something that I think it's worth sitting down um, and also educating ourselves about what you're looking for, but also the realities of what can be done, what can be collected, and what would be a more pertinent research question to this type of population versus, say, for example, mm -hmm. a population in park extension, et cetera. Yeah. And the research hat, like I'm obviously a researcher at the forefront, but this one is more for our health service and delivery and looking at sure. health, health outcomes. So we're going full force with, you know, looking to primarily to deliver this service and this access um, to you know, really, really get at the health inequities between all of, you know, language barriers. So research is a secondary mandate, but it right. certainly will not, um, in, in at least the way that I'm formulating, it won't hinder the progress sure. of this health service model that we're trying to create. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to, I'm just want, wanting to say like how else to move forward. Should I email you and your wife again? <laughs> you know I think I'm on call today and she's on call Wednesday or Thursday. So we'll kind of be at a commission probably till early next week. For sure. <laughs> and yeah. then, then our schedule frees up a bit to be able to chat with you. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. I think my email was at the end. Dr. Hay has my email. Uh, okay. Like I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send it to you in a chat right now. Yeah, that'd be great. And if Dr. Havier interested to include both of you or, but. um. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. Great, yeah, thank you. you can, yeah, you can email both of you, uh, us, you know. Okay, can you put your email there too? Uh, yeah, let me put it here. <laughs> thank you uh, both, it was a fantastic presentation. Um, I, I've learned a lot and um, um, Gabby, I, I don't know, but I also go up to um, Kovinitik. Oh yeah, I used to work here a lot, yeah. <laughs> On, on occasion and uh, it's a it's a different world and yeah it's uh it's interesting at going back to the education uh, is there any possibility of them like putting a building a seizure in Cree territory is that, um, it's, it's, you know yeah, like another level yeah the, I think one of the I think there will be there's always talk with the, one of the issues that arises is, is just that um you'd have to have uh, kids living away from home because uh, each community has a population ranging from let's say 1,000 to 5,000 and so one community would have difficulty running an entire we could maybe pull it off well I mean here we have a secondary school so it would be okay but the smaller communities it gets a bit trickier so uh, you know we like just ask me has a high school uh, which is the equivalent of a sejap uh, not a sejap but once you start to get into that level you get some logistical issues such as where would it be built and are you prepared to have the kids housed where, how, what, where, when. Um, so those are some logistical issues. And so what ends up typically happening is the kids will usually at the moment go to Sejap in Montreal, sometimes in Lac Saint-Jean, but that's a bit less common because English tends to be a bit more commonly used. So John Abbott Ontario as well is also a place where kids will end up going to. And I, I just wonder because I would guess that the kids that do go on have to leave. Yeah. And if you true. and if you were able to put a a, a, ne a next a ne the next level there, um, they wouldn't have to leave. And maybe more would more would. I mean, it's it's one thing to go to Montreal or to uh, yeah. know, Sudbury, um, and it's another thing to go to to Shasabee. The uh, this is this is my pr I don't speak for the Cree school board so yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think the and I think the idea is good I think the biggest um, sticking point will be the issue of the high school graduation rate um, it, you need to fix that first and then go on to step two of getting kids into stage up. Uh, I think it's particularly pronounced here because we have sort of a, a, a way out in a sense that uh, you can send your kids to Montreal or Shibugamu. Mm -hmm. So it, it's particularly pronounced here. It's it's essentially, it's potentially less problematic in some of the smaller communities, but that's one big, big, big thing that the Cree school board is wrestling with uh, all the time. Okay. I, I would just counter and not knowing anything about education at, yeah. at the high school level is that uh, to uh, as some students, they will see, it, yeah. See yeah. it as a dead end. And if you add the another yeah. the next level, yeah. it, it may flow. Yeah. And but, I, I think that's a good point. Role modeling, seeing that, hey, this yeah. is what happens, uh, is, is a very powerful thing. And I think there's a, absolutely a place for that. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Good. And okay. thank you so much, Kavi.
Thanks very much, uh, everyone. Your excellent uh, talk. I think uh, when there's an opportunity, I would love to invite you to talk to our association, you know, oh, sure. annual conference. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> Anytime. You know, subject. Anytime. Yes. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for coming by and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thanks a lot. Take Bye. care. Bye.